Eventide Entertainment presents The Drive-In, hosted by Aaron Lopez. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to The Drive-In. Uh, we are here in Iowa with a family episode for you. Uh, I have my, my wife with us, Jordan, my sister-in-law, Alex, and my mother-in-law, Wendy. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for sitting down with me today. Thanks. Yay. <laughs> um, so to kind of get a little bit of an insight before we get started talking about our movie for this week, um, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of an introduction uh, as far as the movies go with with my, my family here. So, um, Jordan, we'll start with you. Uh, just give us your your favorite movie or your favorite type of movie so our audience knows uh, what kind of movie lover you are. <laughs> um, favorite movie? I don't have one. I'll watch anything. Um, I'm kind of a blasé movie goer. I watch and I judge and I don't have any favorites. All right. Okay. Alex, what about you? Um... I'm a, I'm a pretty girly girl, so I love Disney movies and a good rom-com, but uh, anything with a twist is also... <laughs> what movie is interesting? What Disney movie had a twist? Not a Disney movie, but just I'm trying like, to think. separate genre would be something <laughs> like a Marvel movie, which is also a Disney movie. Type. I'm just thinking, like, is there is there a Disney movie with romantic comedy elements that ends with a twist? Not really. No, not really. <laughs> Maybe maybe like Sleeping Star Beauty. <laughs> maybe. I don't think that would work. No, okay. Um, all right, Wendy, what about you? Favorite movie or favorite type of movie? Um, favorite movie, I like Iron Man. I like Marvel movies. <laughs> I love them. I love them. But I love Iron Man. But I like anything. I'll watch anything. All right, but- so you... You've, we've got uh, on board, we have someone who is blasé, someone who likes uh, romantic comedies and, with twists, <laughs> and somebody who likes Iron Man. So this should be good. We've got a murder mystery that we're going to talk about, so we'll have a 10-minute review for you guys. Um, no, it was, it's uh, glad, glad you guys are on, uh, on today. It's our first time doing more than one guest host, so this is going to be an experience for all of us too. So we're also recording this in stereo. So if you guys are listening, make sure you have both your headphones in. Um, you're going to be hearing people from the sides of the room that they're on. So we'll see how this sounds. Hopefully, uh, it's a good experience for you guys at home. Uh, this week we went and saw Murder on the Orient Express, starring and directed by Kenneth Branagh, which uh, we'll talk about him probably in some some detail. Also featuring pretty much everybody in Hollywood: uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, Daisy Ridley, Leslie Odom Jr., Josh Gad. Uh, Dame Judi Dench, Johnny Depp, and many, many more. Um, Before we get started on our discussion of the movie, though, we did have uh, four trailers for you, um, which surprised me quite a bit. Normally, our trailer rundown is about eight trailers, so this was nice. We got straight to the movie. Uh, The Greatest Showman, starring Hugh Jackman. We have uh, Fifty Shades Freed. I think this is the third. Is this the third or fourth? Third one? Uh, the Commuter, another Leslie Nielsen, or it's not Leslie Nielsen, that's a different guy, Liam Neeson, um, Liam Neeson action movie, and then 12 Strong, the declassified case of uh, the men who were serving uh, in the Middle East. So of those four, uh, did you guys have any that you are excited to see in particular? Probably, uh, what was the first one, the... The, the show, P. T. Barnum. Yeah, the Greatest yeah. Showman. The Greatest Showman. That one looks awesome. Um, and when I was talking to you about it, that it's not usually it's like a Broadway musical move to movie. So this is an original movie musical, mm-hmm. which doesn't usually pan out. But um, this one looks good. I'm kind of interested. Um, and I kind of want to go hate watch the Liam Neeson one because Liam Neeson <laughs> just wanted another action movie, right? but he's too right. old to move around. Right. Yeah. So they gave him a train. On a train so I didn't have to <laughs> Well, I haven't seen any of the Taken movies, but I think that I heard that those are done. So now that he's done with Taken, yeah, maybe we'll see. Yeah, like, now we're going to do four of these and... one. Yeah. yeah. It looked interesting, but it's Liam Neeson, so... I like, feel like, you know, when, like, if you're in high school and you're having a slumber party, it would be a perfect movie. Yeah. Well, if you guys want us to see it, then let me know. But hopefully you everybody is okay with us skipping the commuter. Um... Wendy, Alex, did you guys have one that you were more interested in seeing? Probably, what was the one with the 12? 12, 12 Strong? Yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing that one. It looked interesting. 
I'm kind of but none of them were like, like oh, oh I yeah. have to see it, you know. Okay, well, good. Yeah, I, I, I was excited to. S- I've heard some things about The Greatest Showman. It's coming out around Christmas this year, so that'll be that'll be a good one. It's original music and it's a brand new musical, um, and I've heard some good things about it. So I have heard a lot of uh, historical things about P.T. Barnum. So we'll see how true to life they are, or if they kind of romanticize him a little bit. It doesn't sound like it's going to be um, very true because he seems like a hero, and I'm from what I can remember hearing about Barnum, he was kind of a Kind of a jerk, at least, or at least not necessarily a mean guy, but he kind of was ruthless in the way he set up his business. So we'll see if that works its way into the movie. Um, All right, so we've got our spoiler-free summary for all of you who have not yet seen Murder on the Orient Express. Uh, This comes to you straight from Wikipedia, not Wikipedia, IMDb. Uh, A lavish train ride unfolds into a stylish and suspenseful mystery from the novel by Agatha Christie. Um, Murder on the Orient Express tells of 13 stranded strangers and one man's race to solve the puzzle before the murderer strikes again. Does that sound pretty cohesive? Yeah. yeah. All right. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, go ahead and pause, um, go check it out, and then come back and listen to the rest of it to see if you agree or disagree with our thoughts from, uh, from Murder on the Orient Express. Overall thoughts, though, should our listeners go and see it? Did you guys think it was, it's worth going to see? It's worth it in the theaters. Okay, so maybe, maybe, maybe like a, May, yeah, in the box. same way. It was okay. kind of, yeah, Netflix. Maybe it was good. Go yeah. see it. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I recommend going to see it. We'll get into the details of why in a little bit, but if you're not into murder mysteries, you might want to wait for it. If it intrigues you, just watch the trailer. Um, if it, if it looks interesting to you, you'll probably end up liking it. So. Um, so go ahead and pause right now. We'll talk. We'll see you guys uh, shortly. All right. So now we are just with those who have seen the movie, or as I said last week, just those who like to listen to me and my guest host talk. Um, so let's 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 continue with what we did last week. Last week, um, this was a a bit of um, a trial period to go in sequential order, and I think it worked out. So uh, let's stick to that. We start off the movie with, and I'm probably going to butcher his name because they said it in so many different ways. Alex, you said it right. Hercule Poirot. Poirot. So Detective Poirot, uh, played by Kenneth Branagh. He starts out in Jerusalem, and we have kind of our setup to him as his uh, profession. So he solves mysteries, and he's the best detective in the world, and he's tired of detectiving. He wants a break. What did you guys think of this first setup, though, with the um, the missing, uh, what was it, the the missing artifact? artifact. artifact. Yeah, it really, like, said what it was. yeah, it was just kind of like this little like like little box. box. Yeah. yeah. So, what did you guys think of this setup as far as believing um, Poirot as a successful and brilliant detective? Oh, I thought it was cool. <laughs> um, I also like my eggs to be uniform, so I totally. <laughs> I, I was hoping that little kid was going to be in it a little I bit more. Know, yeah, yeah. He's good. He's so good. It was very <laughs> Sherlockian, and I was kind of like, oh man, I hope it's not just another essentially Sherlock. Like Downey Sherlock. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love Sherlock. It was kind of funny. Yeah. I mean, but and I yeah. liked it, but it, it came in with some trepidation, I guess. Yeah, and I can see when you say that with the Sherlock because when he jams his cane into the wall yeah, yeah. for no he reason. Didn't know what he was doing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You, you definitely felt like it was there for a reason. We're going to see it later on. But by the time we saw it, I at least had forgotten that the cane was there because right. of the action. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he, he lines up the three. And even um, the, the, it was the rabbi, the priest, and I don't remember the third one. It's in Jerusalem, so it might have been from the Muslim faith. Um, I believe it was. I just don't know what they're called. And, and so we, we have these three, and he even talks about it, and it's, it sounds like a bad setup for a joke, but he even makes that connection of like, you know, it's, yes, of course, it's what you expect. Um, but we do get a lot of the quirkiness of Poirot right in the beginning with the eggs, um, with him talking to everybody in the specific way, and being very um, straightforward with it. Did you guys get any inclination that he might be on the spectrum? Like, oh, absolutely. Yeah, he was yeah, OCD. Sure. OCD. He, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It was when he said, um, I think he was talking to that soldier just before he goes on the boat. It's oh, at the beginning. To straighten his tie. Or, to straighten his tie. But he said, I see the world differently. 
where everyone sees the whole world, I only see the imperfections. And I was like, OCD. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, when Absolutely. he steps in the um, horse poop or whatever, it steps in, and then he has to step in with his other foot. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I yeah. Can see that. Yeah. Yeah, because it's the Cause imbalance. The imbalance. He steps oh. in it, and, and then he has that. to step in it with his other foot. Hmm. Which I think that's really cool, and I, you know, and the more you guys are saying that now, the last little monologue that he talked about with the imbalance makes a lot more sense. But we'll get to that in a little bit. But just know, everybody, we're going to come back to this imbalance uh, with Poirot. Um, we eventually, before he leaves, though, he does go to the bakery and uh, meets, and I don't remember his name. I think it's like it's B O U C, and I don't know how you would pronounce that. They didn't really refer to him. The director of the Orient Express, the the guy who was on his side the whole time. It's like Bwok or, or... Uh, yes, it's B O U C, and his name it's Tom Bateman. Is pay, okay. Pays him. So we'll just we'll call him the director of the Orient Express. Um, he's, 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 yeah, that's what I, yeah, we'll call him. Is Bo. he the nephew? <laughs> I don't think he had any I thought relation. He was the, the nephew of the guy that owned the Orient Express. Yes. Yes, he yes, was the nephew. That's why he's the director. Because he said he's a, he's okay. he put him on the train. And, yeah. So there we go. So he, he ends up being here and he's like, yeah, I'll give you a passage to uh, Poirot um, once he figures out that he has to go back to London for a case. Uh, I was a little confused and I might have just been me with the the guy who was bringing him the telegram and um, his whole oh no I know what it's all about already Um, they never unless they did and I just didn't touch upon it they never once went back to that initial telegram did they? I don't know at the very end when he gets off the train and someone is looking for him he says I'm looking for Paro I remember he has the sign Mm -hmm. to pick him up and he goes it's about the I, I thought it was like a Carter. Car- I thought it was a casing yeah. or something case. So that he talked about the case when he got that telegram, and then at the very end when he's being picked up and leaving, he's already on. The but is it the same case though? Because I thought I that thought it was it denial. Was it, no, like, it was no. It was the same one because it was the C word. I swear it was. Because I thought it was the Armstrong case that got him onto the train to begin with. No, 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 no. no. That's totally. That different. was the telegram, which it was. A, it was casing or something was the name of the case that was on the telegram, and that's what took him to oh. Ireland, not the Armstrong. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, so he gets this, this telegram, and he gets back. He gets his way on, and this is one of the biggest unanswered questions that I just didn't remember the person, but he ends up taking the spot because the train is completely booked, and he ends up taking the spot of someone who does not check in on time. Is that a person of any significance? Did you guys remember the name of the person? Okay, I did the yeah. same thing. And it, apparently it's the secretary. Okay. That's what was the, his, like, He was secretary. already on but not checked in yeah, or he something. Didn't check he didn't in, but check he was in. on the train. Okay. But he was on, that's why he had to bump talked about... Uh, McQueen. Yeah, like it was McQueen. Family. McQueen. Okay. That's why they had to room together. Yeah. But I swear it did not start... Like, McQueen is a name I would have remembered, but yeah. I remember yeah, it I started it, with a B. I and it started with an H. <laughs> <laughs> We're so good at this. Well, Willem Dafoe played Hardman. <laughs> Derek Jacoby played Bedos or Bedos. Who's that? That okay. was no, that's no, that's the butler of Ratchet. Okay, the older guy. Okay, so the older I general. thought it was a B letter. Yeah, and that's something that we had talked about before we started. There were so many characters in this movie that. You knew who everybody was. It was very; they were very clearly defined as far as race, gender, profession. Um, you, that was clear, and they were all very well known actors, so we kept them straight. But their names were not used very much. You have Johnny Depp yeah, was, as Ratchet, and you have Josh Gad as McQueen. That were those were the only two yes. that I remember hearing exactly. a lot. Exactly. Yeah, I, I agree. Well. And they, they say over. Time. Oh yeah, he's yeah. all the time. They mentioned Leslie Odom as the Doctor the entire time. Yeah. Never um, his name. Yeah. It. They didn't really have any names. Well, and half the people that were playing a character, that wasn't actually their name. So, you know, you yeah. know later That's that true. was someone else, so yeah. it's kind of a mixed bag. So speaking of all these characters, we as we get our way onto the train, little by little, these characters start coming into our story. Um, we see, I think the first one that we see is... Uh, either Daisy Ridley or Leslie Odom Jr. I don't remember which of those two, but they were both the first two that we see. Mm-hmm. Um, and and they have something going on. We, we As the movie goes on, we see them conversing quite a bit, 
quietly and secretively. Uh, but then we see Josh Gad, uh, we see Johnny Depp's character, Penelope Cruz comes in, and just little by little you start seeing these people coming into the train. But there seems to be a little mystery with each of them. Um, were any of them, when you first saw them, because everybody had their little moment, um, which of them were you, were you happiest to see, or which one was the most exciting for you? Probably Michelle Pfeiffer's character. Uh, her name was... Was that Hubbard? Mrs. Hubbard, Hubbard. yeah. Because mm-hmm. um, I instantly hated her. <laughs> <laughs> Pfeiffer's not a likable so, actress very she, often. But she was annoying. doing it on purpose, we found yeah. that later, mm-hmm. that she was trying to right. be annoying and distracting, um, but she ended up being... Um, she made it so obvious to me, at least. It was like, well... Like, when she shows up with the knife in her back, I was like, well, she obviously did that herself. I thought she did, too. <laughs> yeah. What about you guys? Are there any characters that jumped out to you right off the bat? No, I I liked Michelle Pfeiffer. It had been so long since I'd seen her. It's been, she hasn't been in anything been recently. Anything. You know, so it was kind of interesting to see her. And uh, Judy Dent, she didn't say a whole lot. Through the whole well, thing. She, I mean, she's Dame Judy Dent. Yeah, she didn't yeah, just show up. She just and, shows up. And, I was yeah. going to say, you don't need anything from Daisy yeah. Judy Dench. And I thought it was very fitting like that she plays Daisy, that, yeah. da- uh, Daisy Ridley. Yeah, well, what was her name? Uh, Mary something. Um, she was the governess. Yeah, again. Uh, Mary Devin something. Again, we don't, I mean, I don't remember the names. Yeah. You know, yeah. But, but I liked her too. So, yeah, I was going to say, like, Dame Judy Dench as the princess, how fitting, because exactly. she is royalty and, you know, she is acting yeah. royalty, treated like royalty. She didn't have to say anything. She just showed she didn't, up. She didn't, you know. Mm-hmm. I liked her little snippy remarks the entire time. Yeah. When she was talking she's to sassy. her maid, and her maid said, I, grew, I brushed the dog. No, you tortured my dog. <laughs> <laughs> that would be me, though. Yeah. Like, I would totally do that. Yeah, I, I would have to say, I think the one that I was most excited to see was Daisy Ridley um, as, as the governess, just because we were so close to Star Wars, and I just kept thinking in my head, Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars. Um, <laughs> I, I blacked out for a little bit and just started imagining what was going to happen next month. Um, but no, I, I thought she did a really good job, and when she came into play, uh, she's just a great actress, and I'm excited to, to see more of her in the future. So it was cool to, to see her. And then Leslie Odom Jr. from uh, Hamilton. Very excited, Very excited to see excited him, to him make his way into the film world. He did a really good job. We didn't really recognize him. Really 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 that's something we had said. I didn't recognize him. And I was like, well, it's got to be him. It's Leo Fleet Jr. It's got to be him. Yeah. But Leslie Odom, I was telling you this last night, he has amazing cheekbones and he always looks so shiny. So I think I put some type of prosthetic on him. Or just really good really good really good makeup because he did not have his cheekbones and he was older. And that stupid little mustache. Well, we should know also, too. Be, 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 be on stage the probably shininess was just sweat from being on stage and the stage lights and moving around and dancing as okay. much as he did in Hamilton but look at his state front commercials I know he's also he's shiny, shiny in those yeah. so. so but yeah so it, we, we did have a lot of really cool characters and one of the things that I really liked uh, right off the bat was one of the is something that they did about three or four times in the movie single takes visually as far as filming the, what was the first time that Branagh's character, Poirot, is going down the train toward where he is staying, and it's with Pfeiffer, and it's one shot outside the train going down, and we see some of the other characters. We see the kind of the, the structure of the train from front to back, um, and they did a really, they did this a few times, um, and we'll talk about them when we get there, but what did you guys think of, of those shots in particular? Did you like them? I liked them. It was different. It did. It showed you through the window, you know, the different characters and stuff like that. I liked it. That was kind of one of the first things we talked about leaving the movie was we, we liked the movie, but we really loved those shots. The different that things really... that did. And those are hard to do. Those are very difficult because one thing goes wrong and you're not just looking at one person and their facials and their lines and everything. You're taking in every single uh, variable around the entire studio or wherever they ended up filming this. And it's difficult. So they did them a few times and I thought they did them very well. Um, Poirot, let's see, he's uh, approached by Ratchet, which is Johnny Depp's character, to act as a bodyguard. Uh, Poirot says no. And this was a really, this was, to me, the first, First of many times, but one, the one that solidified it for me is Poirot's um, very specific way of thinking. We mentioned earlier how he sees the world differently. He says he's of an age where he knows things that he does like and things that he doesn't like. And the things that he doesn't like, he hates. And the things he likes, uh, does like, he likes a lot. 
Um, and this whole back and forth between Depp and Poirot or, and Brano was just really interesting. And if you didn't beforehand, if you didn't know that Depp's character was kind of a villain or a bad guy, you got the impression after this conversation. What do you guys think? <laughs> um, well, could you tell by the scars on his face? All, all over. <laughs> yeah. Like it was just that was another thing. It was kind of hokey and a little too obvious. Like, man, I guess Johnny Depp's the evil guy. <laughs> Well, and doesn't Branagh say that one of the reasons why he won't do it is because he doesn't like his face? Yes, yes. and yes. I was the only one that laughed. Yeah. You laughed really loud. You are so yeah. loud. And I'm just like, well, he just yeah, looks at him and goes, also, I don't like your face, and then just keeps moving. Yeah. <laughs> He's funny. Jordan, are you, are you trying to tell me something? Like, are you detect, like a detective? Because you go around telling people that all the time. I am a detective. Just, I don't like your face. Oh. <laughs> I just don't know it. She's a brilliant detective. <laughs> we, this is how we find out. So Poro says no, says he does not want to do it. Um, he does enjoy his reading, and that's all he wants to do on this train. Um, and we really do get to see the quirkiness of Poro that first night. So he's in his bedroom, and he has to get up and out of bed like three different times. And he's reading, he hears a noise, he reacts to it. Um, what What did you guys think of Branagh's quirkiness, um, or, or his portrayal of Poro and this just this overall character? Because I thought he did a phenomenal job. He's my favorite character. I absolutely loved him. I I don't know why I connected with him so well, but for whatever reason, I'm like, I love him. I love his little mustache, mustache. thing. Oh, it was like huge. Sleeping. Oh, it was just so, so good. Now, on that real quick, mustache, do you guys think that was actual, or did, do you think that was prosthetic? Because I, that was that was huge. That was like three mustaches put together. I think it's prosthetic. I think it's prosthetic. Prosthetic. I'm gonna look that up because if he, because yeah. I feel like like there were a couple times where like the edges like weren't like, like yeah, just like a couple little. Things. Can we talk about the mustache cover though that he wore? Yeah, yeah, in that bed. was funny. Is that, that was... real? <laughs> I don't I'm know. sure it, is. it probably is a real thing, like or was a real thing. Must have been. <laughs> well, you do hear about people who take extreme care of their facial hair, um, you know, and and modern times definitely. But I'm, I wouldn't surprise me if. You know, that's part of your identity specifically. And multiple people even came up to him in the movie saying, like, I recognize the mustache, you know. And and so maybe it'd be pretty interesting if that actually was a real thing, like the cover. And I'm going to look this up at some point and find out. Because if he did, Branagh's my new favorite actor. That was, fa- <laughs> that was fantastic. Wendy, what did you think about um, Branagh and his portrayal of Poirot? I liked him. And the OCD thing, every, you know, again... Every time something, there was a noise, he's up, looking out the door, you know, lay down, back up, lay down, back up. You know, I, I love the OCD and the, how he portrayed that. And tr- it, people with OCD, it's true. I mean, that's just what they do. It was, it was almost like he had his routine. Because yeah. he, he said, he said goodnight to his Catherine, which you never get a whole lot of detail of, but a lost right. love. He talks about he loved somebody once and it didn't work out. Um, but we have his him going down, and I almost felt like he was going to turn the light off like three times and do his right. like patterns. Or, it almost yeah, felt that or, way. Or lock the door five times. You yeah, know, whatever. Oh. Jordan, what about you? Uh, he was awesome. I thought he was a really good actor. Um, I liked his thought process. I liked how he just kind of told it and how it was. How he felt. Like now, me. <laughs> I have to ask you though, because you do have difficulty sometimes with accents. Were you able? <laughs> Like, I mean, were you able to understand him the entire movie? Or were there some things that you just had to kind of take in context and say, okay, that's what's happening? Okay, I would have to say, I'm like Jordan. I have a hard time with accents. <laughs> okay. See, you know, just... even today on the TV, I couldn't understand him. <laughs> so there were some things that I'm like, I don't know what he said. You know, I had a hard time. It was this. heavy. I honestly yeah. it was fine. Okay. Really? Yeah, I oh, didn't have a wow. problem. Well, that's good. The worst part was his name. The, the name. Well, they, yeah, yeah the, the name. I and they said it like a hundred times. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when he ways. says his name in his accent, I was waiting because I'm like, that's not how I'm going to pronounce it. So I'm waiting for someone else someone to say else. it. Yeah. And I think it was when Depp said it in that conversation where I was like, wow, Ro, okay, here we go. <laughs> With the, um, the very Bostonian accent. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we've got this avalanche that that is really the the driving force behind our entire movie. If the avalanche doesn't happen, then we don't have the time to figure out who the the murderer is. So the avalanche, which I felt that the the one thing they did well in the movie um, visually was not the special effects. It looked really CGI. Um, There were a couple moments to me. The very final scene, we knew it was CGI, but it still looked cool. But 
that avalanche to me, mm, it seemed kind of... Yeah, kind of lame. Yeah, kind of fake. I just feel like they they needed something to stop the train, and they just came up with this random avalanche. And how it didn't get pushed off the edge, I will never know. Yeah, only only the 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 front part came off, Uh and it didn't get pushed off the edge, and the rest is just sitting fine on the bridge. Yeah. Guys, they spent all the money on his mustache. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) They couldn't spend a whole lot on the train. (laughs) So that night, Poirot is murdered. We wake up in the morning. Say that again? Not Poirot, thank you. Ratchet. I'm looking at my notes and I even have... I have Ratchet. So we've got Ratchet murdered. Poirot, that'd be a short movie if Poirot was murdered. Um, so he, Ratchet, uh, Johnny Depp's character, gets murdered. He ends up being stabbed 12 times. And this is another one of those really cool views. We see it from the very top. The eagle eye view of the hallway. They do not show you Depp right away. And then they pan back outside of the room into... Uh, Poirot's room where they figure out what they have to do. Everything being on the top, though, that was what I was really excited about because you did not see their facial expressions, which it probably was kind of important that we didn't see the doctors at that point. Um, But for such an important moment to not see any facial reactions was a bold move, and I think it it paid off because it was one of the moments I remembered. That's the moment I remember, too. I thought it was the weirdest thing to everything. You were just looking down. Like you said, there's no facial expression. You never saw the body. You never saw anything. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought it was the neatest thing. I was waiting for them, and they, they did show that they could do it when they went from the hallway into one of the rooms. I was waiting for them to go into uh, Ratchet's room and show the body. They show the body. Which they eventually do later, but not in that scene, which I think was kind of intriguing because... Is, when they go in there and they do see the body, the doctor wasn't in there, was he? No. no. When yeah. they went back in that see, second when they went time. Back in, yeah. Yeah, it was just... Uh, it was just him and the... And, or, and the, Bo... Our, yeah, both. Our director guy. I feel guy. like at that point, like, at that point, you're like, who did it? Mm-hmm. How? Like, the viewers are trying to figure out what the heck happened. And by doing it that way, you took all the emotion out of it. So you're just, like, trying to, like, look at all the evidence. Like, what's in there? Mm-hmm. What can I see? Kind of like looking in a shoebox almost. And yeah. Like, I think I think that was a really great t- touch, because if you're looking at the body, then the viewer is, like, either gross or sad that that guy died, although, I, I mean, I don't know why really he's a criminal, but, you know, with that way, you're kind of looking at it in Poirot's perspective, and just no motion, mm-hmm. look at the evidence, look at the facts. Yeah, it was it was neat, and I was... It, it was one of my favorite parts. Mm-hmm. I loved it, and, I, and that's that's not the last time they, they do some camera shots. And speaking of camera shots, they um, I did look up and find out that this was filmed, the entire movie, um, or at least major parts of it, were filmed in 65mm, so you do get a little bit of that older style, the look of it, um, and that's probably where some of the crispness comes in. So for them to add these kind of camera tricks of single shots probably was also a necessity because of the camera that they were using, and... They did it very well, so. I actually hated the eagle eye view. <laughs> you didn't like it? Oh, I loved it. No, the whole time I was like, all right, I'm done looking at the bald spot on Poros. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep, like Alex said, the mystery is now on. Um, we are all, as an audience, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and this is where this is where you start to see the investigation um, start to take place. So Poirot and Bo investigate. Uh, the clues are coming out very quickly. Every interview starts to add a little bit more to the whole piece. Um, we start with uh, the story of um, Daisy Armstrong and her family, which is very important to the entire thing. And it feels like it has some importance, uh, but at first glance, it kind of just feels like a sad story. Um, but McQueen is our first one questioned, um, and everybody else is questioned little by little. Um, what did you guys think of? Because we're going to kind of like take this whole investigation as a whole, because there really wasn't a lot that happened between the first investigation and the last, other than Arm or not Armstrong uh, McQueen leaving the train for a little bit to try to burn evidence. But what did you guys think of the in whole like investigation section of the movie, which is kind of like. 25, 30 minutes of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so I liked the Armstrong case that he went into, but it left a lot of questions for me. Why did Johnny why? Depp steal a little girl and kill her? Yeah. Um, why did Poirot know that Johnny Depp was the killer when, well, we learned later that everyone knew that, but I, it didn't seem to be a big deal. You know, it, it was interesting. I liked that that was the basis for everyone being connected, but I didn't understand 
some of the pieces that were missing. Kind of like another mystery to be sort of yeah. solved. Yeah, it was kind of strange. But um, I loved the whole going through, figuring out everyone, where they were that night, what they were doing, um, and him kind of connecting the dots. When you were, you were almost, as an audience member, you planted yourself in Poirot's spot. So when you heard an alibi or you saw a piece of evidence, you were checking that person off the list and saying, mm-hmm. okay, so those two people are out, that person's out, who else could it be? Mm-hmm. And so that was kind of cool to see those pieces added little by little. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, that is one big question, is I do remember the moment where Paro says that he was Cavietti, I think the name was, but um, here's his real name, and that's he was the person who ends up killing uh, little Daisy Armstrong, and I think it was he was he kidnapped her for a ransom, he got the money, but still ended up killing, killing, her. killing her. So I don't know why. Yeah, you don't know what happens, you don't know. So some, some, some questions mystery. there. Which, I mean, uh, yeah. Isn't the main point. It's not, yeah. but... You know, there. we do we too we do take a lot for granted in what Poirot says as being just true because he just sees all these things and I think that was one of them that they just said well the audience isn't going to question it we just won't focus on it too much so we'll see um, this I think this is a good spot though to stop so we will take a little break let's all go to the lobby get some drinks get your popcorn refilled and let's see what is coming up soon from Eventide. <laughs> You know, there's nothing quite as satisfying as a good conversation with intelligent company. Join comedian Don Smith every week as he sits down and talks with comedians, actors, filmmakers, writers, and everyday schmoes. It's The Life with Don Smith, Wednesdays at noon on 106.9 FM, and now available on the Eventide Entertainment Podcast feed every Friday on Spreaker, YouTube, and iTunes. The weekdays are made for working, but the weekends, those are made for gaming. Join Ellison Smith every Saturday for a new episode of Saltwater Gaming as he breaks down video games of all different genres, consoles, platforms, and eras. Get a bit of the old and a bit of the new, a bit of the action and a bit of the mystery. Get it all every Saturday on Saltwater Gaming, brought to you by Eventide Entertainment. There's a reason they call them Lazy Sundays. There's nothing better than sitting around and enjoying the comforts of a good book. But what book should that be? Well, every Sunday, Eventide brings you The Bookseller, hosted by Jessica Gillen. Each week, Jessica breaks down a different book and tells you everything you need to know before cracking it open and getting lost in a whole new world. Tune in every Sunday for The Bookseller with Jessica Gillen, brought to you by Eventide Entertainment. Are you into making music, videos, or podcasts? Are you a local comedic talent in need of some much-needed publicity? Are you a behind-the-scenes professional interested in audio-video production, graphic design, and public relations? Eventide Entertainment is actively seeking talents, clients, and professionals to help our business grow into something truly special. And we want you to be one of those. For more information, go to facebook.com slash eventideentertainment or send us an email at eventideent at gmail.com. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, last you heard from us, we were talking about this investigation. Um, for me, this is where the movie kind of started to lose me a little bit. Um, I think there were too many one-on-one moments um, for having a cast as brilliant as it was. It was like, oh, we're going to give Daisy Ridley five minutes, and now we're going to give Willem Dafoe five minutes, and now we're going to... You know, it just kind of was like, okay, which made sense as far as the investigation goes, because that's what happens. But... It's a movie, and for me, this is where it got a little stagnant as far as the storyline. We kept getting little pieces, but um, I don't know. What what did you guys think as far as these one-on-one interviews? Did you like them? Did you hate them? Did you not care? Um, uh, yeah. Mom and I, after the movie, were like, they were like a little, there were a couple times where it was just a little, a little bit slow. slow. And yeah. so we kind of, uh, were kind of on you, with you where it. It got. It was just slow. I it mean, wasn't the worst. It, it wasn't the worst. Slowest but, thing ever. And you but, don't learn a whole lot. About yeah, the that's, and that kind of annoyed me. Yeah, I'm like, I don't. I didn't this know isn't anything. helping. You know, really, in in my little clue thing, trying to figure out who did what. <laughs> okay, but guys, like in an actual investigation, right. that's what they well, go. And that's what exactly. You have to do. I don't think there's a way around. <laughs> yeah, that. I don't think there's but, a way they could have done it differently. I like 
those parts. I like the slowness, trying to figure out who's lying and, you know, putting the pieces together. <laughs> I'm literally the opposite. Yeah, Jordan is the type of person Jordan. who will sit and listen to 20 hours of right. murder mystery podcasts no, about no. one case, and she loves it. So yeah. this was her movie, absolutely, that style. So, yeah. um, except, for I, I eagle eye. Eye. except for the eagle eye. Except for the eagle eye. I got a little bored during that. Yeah, and, and that was one that for me, it was it was kind of a, a down, or maybe not downhill, it just kind of plateaued for a while. But then all of a sudden, um, it very quickly catches up. We get Hubbard who gets stabbed in the back, that's uh, Michelle uh, Pfeiffer's character. She gets stabbed in the back, and um, I, I don't know, but the sound of the knife coming out was a little disturbing to me when they pulled the knife out, and it just was like... It was a little, like, muscly and squishy. And, <laughs> um, and I think it was the doctor. or Somebody, she, the doctor pulls it out. Odom pulls it out. Um, and this is where, like I said, that it's, like, it, it, you get a little, things start to, to pick up, but there's more questions for me. Um, the passengers are all taken off while the engine is put back on the track. They say, it's not safe. We're going to put you in the tunnel. But no one goes to get Poirot or Daisy, Daisy. Ridley. Yeah, they just let them just yeah, and they're run around like on a cargo one, like yeah. the cargo mm-hmm. tray at the bottom. Which would be at the front? No, it would be or at the back. It'd be the, toward the back. Toward the back. So that's upright on the bridge. Yeah. Because yeah, edge, because and we edge. see that because Odom they're sitting yeah. right on the edge at the bridge. I mean, they're right yeah, in the car true. on the edge. Right. You know, like and, and he's going to push her off. Or Poirot something. is a major personality. They would have remembered to take him off, like. Right. If you're looking at all the different passengers that are there, you're gonna definitely make sure that our, our I don't even remember well, what country they wanted him from. in first class to begin with. Yeah, yeah. and they were gonna take care They'd of it. Take care of him. But then all of a sudden he's not there, and it's I, and I'm even thinking to myself, well maybe maybe Bo was saying, well they should be able to. He needs to have time to talk to her individually. Yeah. But at the same time, if it's not safe and they're sitting over the edge, it doesn't matter because if they knock it and it falls off, then he's dead. Yeah. Why are they sitting right on the edge? Yeah, First of all, two things. Poirot can do whatever, whatever he wants. wants. Okay. Two, in, I believe it's towards the very end, Penelope Cruz actually stands at the back of a train, and it's not a cargo train. Well, no, it's no, not the it's last one. It's not no. the last one. Okay. It's like somewhere, but, but it's towards, towards, towards the, the back. back. Yeah. Okay, yes. that does not make sense, though. Why would you have a cargo train in between customer train? Like It was, cars? it was, oh, okay, so here's the thing. It was open, which it normally would not have been open. But that was the cargo was where they held all their luggage, so that wouldn't have been at the very back because the very back would have been like a caboose. So yeah, and and first class, class would have been at the front because the, the further are you are toward the back, the shakier it is. Yeah. So that's why the first class is the nicest because it's right there and you're right next to the engine, which is immediately pulling. So I don't know. So clearly, though, there are some some plot points, some questions with that. Um. So the doctor, well, Mary, the governess, doesn't really claim responsibility for it, but she does um, kind of own up to knowing uh, the the Daisy, Daisy Armstrong, who this whole Armstrong case is the driving force behind the entire movie, it turns out. And she admits to it, and all of a sudden we have our one jump moment of the entire movie where I think everybody crapped their pants a little bit. <laughs> We have the doctor, Leslie Odom, Jr.'s character, shoots Shoots. and hits um, Poirot in the arm. Um, And it's important to remember that uh, we find out earlier that he was a sniper. So there's kind of something that goes through Poirot's head later on. Um, Was this something, another thing that I missed? Poirot looks over, and this might have been the whole missing element, but he looks behind him and he sees, I think it's a sandbag or something. Yes. Was that just the missing part that he notices? But they, they... clearly show him look behind him they focus in on whatever it is that's that's pouring out, pouring out. and then they come back i didn't know he what it was that later to hit no he hits him with a good butt of a gun i thought Bo saves saves Poirot yeah, that way. but before that pro- he like doesn't he shoot again oh he does take his cane and hit it and at him it. To, to throw him off so that might be so it. so that might be it yeah because i kind of like there was a connection there i just didn't know exactly what happened okay so we have the, the doctor who says that he did it, Mary didn't do anything, um, we, I don't know, to me it was just very quick, for as, as slow of a plateau that we had on all these interviews, it was, oh, all of a sudden 
we have our murderer and which isn't the end of the story but the end of the story comes pretty quickly after this um what did you guys think of this uh quote-unquote reveal with daisy ridley and lizzie odom did you believe it were you sold on this being the ending no no not even sort of <laughs> why not did you, just not I didn't had, believe it from the beginning um what's her face mrs hubbard pfeiffer yeah, yeah. Shot pfeiffer. pfeiffer as the killer from the very beginning, and I was like, so when they named McQueen, I'm like, no, first of all, we're only halfway through it. Forget that. It's never the first it's, yeah, yeah, it's never the first guy. <clears throat> so then they came up with her, and I'm like, she's just not doing it for me. And I'm like, even if I'm wrong, it's not her. <laughs> it can't, I don't know why. There was just something about her that, she, I'm like, she's too, like, coy and cool about it. She's not worried at all. Yeah, Jordan, what did you think? Um... I don't know, I, I was kind of sick of the focus being on those two, um, mainly because I was like, oh, they're two big stars, so let's just focus mm-hmm. on them and give them more showtime. So I get it, but I was just... That is something to note, though. <clears throat> of all of the stars in the movie, outside of the guy who ended up, the Cuban guy, the chauffeur, who could have been taken from the movie altogether, we would have lost yeah, a thing. Yeah, he had two seconds of yeah. dialogue, and then I don't even remember how he was connected to the Armstrong case. He was... He uh, was he the dri- driver? He was the driver. He was a chauffeur. Yeah, he was a chauffeur. Who, so it was, but yeah, he, he is the one character in the entire movie who could have been taken out and would not have had anything missing from him at and all. And he's the one that's now living in America selling something, right? That was yeah, the same guy. Yeah, yeah. No selling, selling cars, wasn't it? Or, yeah, yeah, it was cars. Something, yeah. It was cars. Yeah. And it was just like, the, I didn't, why did yeah, they Yeah, at the end, him? at the end when they showed him like at the table and he was there again, I was like, oh, I forgot all about that guy. I could not remember who that man was. No well, and here's here's a note though. Michael Pena was supposed to be that guy. So Michael Pena, if you guys aren't, if you don't remember, he is the Hispanic actor who is in Ant Man, uh, the kind of nerdy oh. that who he was originally supposed to be him, and then he dropped out before filming oh. started, and he was replaced with this other actor. So I mean, oh, I would have liked it the other way. Yeah. But still, I I mean, even we would have liked he, the actor more. Right. We knew more facial but recognition. Still, and maybe he had more in it before maybe they may, have rewritten. Awesome. Yeah. They may have rewritten some parts yeah. of it because this whoever I don't know who the actor was I was looking it up and the only thing that had like the main people right here Adam Garcia as Italian fam no if that wasn't him no? it was a hyphenated last name um he's not listed in the main stuff I'll, I'll look further okay. and find him later but yeah he was the one that to me could have been completely removed from it um, but outside of him, um, you've got, you, cause this whole thing that we were talking about is Jordan had just mentioned how you have, uh, Leslie Odom Jr. and Daisy Ridley is getting a lot of attention of all of the, the actors and actresses in this movie. They're the two of them who I would consider to be the biggest up and coming actors. Maybe Josh Gad being a third and he would be the third one that was focused on the most. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. do not see a lot of focus on these main character, these big name people. Like we said earlier, Dame Judi Dench, Penelope very Cruz. minimal. I mean, Penelope Cruz, minimal. minimal. Willem Dafoe has his one scene where you find out he's he's kind of undercover as well, and that's it. So you have a lot of these main people who are not getting a whole lot of attention, which is interesting. I don't know for what reason, maybe just looking into it a little too much, but I think it's, it's kind of cool to see these up-and-coming actors getting more stage time or more uh, screen time. Um, I think they did well, but I kind of agree that it was the focus was on them a lot, and even even Josh Gad as McQueen, the focus was on him a lot too. Even though we were pretty clear it wasn't him, as he was the first one. Um, okay, so the doctor claims responsibility, shoots Poirot in the arm, uh, eventually is saved by uh, his his buddy uh, Bo. Then we see that the uh, the train is ready to go. It's been the snow has been cleared. Um, but before they can go, they have to finish up this discussion and f- discover who the murderer is. So Poirot gives his two ideas. He says there's a lo- there's either two ideas. There's one, the lone assassin who jumped off the train, um, or you all did this. You all killed Ratchet. Every passenger uh, had a hand in it. And he goes on this long 10-minute discussion of how everybody is connected, which is kind of cool. Though not all of them had we completely figured out. Um, but... Everybody had a connection to the Armstrong case, um, either through a a connection to almost like a second or three third degree of connection, or it was somebody who was related directly. 
Um, we find out that Michelle Pfeiffer's character, Mrs. Hubbard, uh, was the organizer of it. She ends up being Daisy Armstrong's grandmother, um, who is mentioned early on as an actress, not necessarily this character, but a character that we, without a name, um, or a face, she has a name, is given uh, discussion through Dame Judi Dench saying how she knew this person. She was a great actress, but it kind of ruined her. And this is who ends up being uh, Michelle Pfeiffer's character. So, um, what of the big reveal, we still have a little bit more of storyline, but of this huge reveal, were you satisfied with that being the ending, that being the, that it being 12 people all taking part in this murder? Yes, absolutely, 100%. I loved it. Um, one of the main reasons I loved it was because, um, you know, he figured out that they were all, all of them were at fault. And you honestly, if you had paid attention, you could have figured that figured that out from the beginning because of the stabbing. Stab wounds. Yep. Yeah, the one piece of evidence exactly. that... could have figured that the out. The only right. thing Simple. with the stabbing that the other <coughs> could have been... Only because the number 12 didn't have any significance to me at the time was that I was like, maybe it was like a woman that like stabbed a woman because they're emotional or whatever. And well, they did and talk about the first two, eyes, but there was yeah. a difference between the first two and then the other. Yeah, right. and the first two, which they said probably killed him, and then the other ones, which were just barely, you know, flesh wounds right. that right. just said barely, which we don't actually understand who hits who. But we know that, or who hits where, but we know that Pfeiffer was the last one. Because they do show um, the, kind of the order. It's kind of dark and, and hard to see, but definitely uh, you do get some sort of an order. Michelle Pfeiffer's character is the last one to stab, and she does seem to stab up toward the, the, the face area, so which would be the two that were deepest. So I think it is interesting, though, because Penelope Cruz would have been one of those as, as the, um, the nun or the sister who would not have probably gone as deep. So he starts to at least, it doesn't give anything for the storyline, but you start to play this out and say, okay, who would have been the people who would have taken part in it but would not have felt the enough anger or would not have been justified to themselves to say, let's drive the knife all the way in. So she is one of them that jumps out to me. Um maybe Dame Judy Dench just because she's not strong enough at that old age, but I don't know. That knife was pretty sharp, so. Uh, so, overall, Jordan, you were pretty satisfied. Alex, Wendy, what did you guys think? I was satisfied. It was all of them. I mean, I, I liked that better than just one. Yeah, I think it was good. It was good. And, you know, together. Connected we made them together. all important again. Yeah, there was an, like, an emotional know, connection. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, like the chauffeur, we were like, who the heck was that? Mm-hmm. Or Penelope Cruz wasn't in there very much, hardly. And it just kind of brought them all back. Yeah, to the it just shows that, you know, the, the one event, how it affects everybody, you know. And on that note, though, Penelope, Penelope Cruz had a reason to be there. Oh, yeah, yeah. The driver sure. had no yeah, the driver oh, yeah. had no reason <laughs> Except that he just cared Penelope about the family. Penelope made sense. Yeah, Penelope yeah. Cruz's character right. being I, the, I the nurse who lot. fell asleep um, because, and, she was because she was drinking. And we see that Johnny Depp walks through the window in this flashback. He, he crawls in through the window, um, hits her, and then takes the child and leaves. So she, she kind of is where this all started. Confusing, though, I guess, as to why she didn't get more time if she was such a major player mm-hmm. in this. That's kind of she what, was that boring. Would be one that... See, I liked her. No. I didn't. Oh, okay. She's boring. So, she's a great actress. She played the character wonderfully. Yeah. But she just wasn't a boring like character. I guess her story is a little bit straightforward, like, yeah. so I can see. But, yeah, but I don't understand I mean, I just, how she had... They talked about her in the context of having her knuckles all bruised up. Or not bruised up, but, like, kind of so worn off fighting. from fighting. So, did she go through this after? Was the fighting, did that occur after yeah. Daisy? Or was that when she grew up? It sounded like when, like, being a nurse with Maisie and before, she was just, she probably had a rough life and okay. grew up fighting for herself. It didn't really herself. expand on it, though. No. She did not. And see, that's, I think that's one of my biggest issues with this movie, is they're outside of maybe Michelle Pfeiffer's character, and that would be a stretch, it would really only be Kenneth Branagh's character, Poirot, who had any character arc, and his really wasn't much of an arc. Right. He ends up having a, a aha moment, but it's it's all on the back end. We all figure out about him having this aha moment at one time. Everybody else, their start, middle, and end is pretty much the same. And there's not a whole lot of development as far as characters. Um, 
So, okay, let's keep going here. We've got um, Poirot. He gives the gun, so he figures this out, and he decides that he cannot. He tells them he cannot go on and lie. He's going to have to tell the truth. Bo would be able to lie, and he he's better at it than, uh, than Poirot is. He says, I'm going to give you the gun. You're going to have to shoot me, commit one more crime, and then you guys are all be free. So he sets the gun on the table in front and says, somebody do it. Uh, and Michelle Pfeiffer's character picks it up, points it at him. We think she's going to shoot him. She turns the gun on herself and tries to shoot herself, but it's an empty gun. So Poirot just essentially wanted to see what the reaction would be um, to this. He goes through and says that he's not going to turn him in. It, the reason he did it, though, was... Because in the end he says, I'm not turning you in because you you're not killers. You're good people, you're good people yeah, who deserve um, a chance. The doctor didn't kill him when he shot him. He shot him in the arm. Like, basically just a quick stitch, no big deal, wound. Um, and he, he did the, the gun with no bullets because he wanted to see... If they're really killers, then they absolutely deserve to go to jail, and they shouldn't have done this. But mm -hmm. if they weren't going to kill him or anyone. Well, then they don't—they don't deserve it. They—they they killed for justice. Yeah, not which their own selfish needs. That's that big discussion I think at the end that we said we would come back to the imbalance. So Poirot says that sometimes life does not have to be imbalanced, and they—they they killed for justice, and. Um, they they didn't deserve to go to jail because what they did was they were trying to do what he does every day, which is trying to balance out um, life. But he said it's okay. Sometimes life doesn't have to be balanced because what would happen if he sent them all to jail, then they'd go to jail for doing something, for correcting the balance, and then that it would be imbalanced again. So he's like comes to this conclusion that it's okay, and essentially this is going to be an imbalanced case, but one that is just in the end. Um disembarks the train when they finally get to their next stop it says he's going to continue talking with some of the local police to get this figured out but then is taken away uh for his next case uh the case in the nile which is another agatha christie movie or a uh, book do you think we'll get a sequel from this because it definitely left it open for another poirot story um uh, what do you guys think um probably just a money issue how many people go to see this movie and how many, you know, critics or whatever. Kind of like Star Wars. Did you need six more movies? Probably not. <laughs> it's open if it financially benefits whoever is running the whole show. Yeah. I think... I say if there's another one, I'm not sure I would go to the movie theater and see it. I might see it, you know, Redbox, Netflix. I think it would depend who they had in yeah. it. I think this one, they but did a really good job of getting so many people. In it and you never, they never, there's not any substance. I mean, there's not really. There's not a whole lot of depth. There's not a whole lot of depth to them, you know, and there was a ton of people in it. Jordan, you look like you have something. No, I would go see a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> because Jordan, we know. I really <laughs> liked it. Um, my only problem with the sequel is that not all 12 people can justify killing one person in every single movie. So There's going to have to be something new to yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, you know, it they'd have to go all out to do it. But Agatha, Agatha Christie is the best Ugh. mystery writer. So, yeah. right. I mean, well, why Kenneth, not bring herself what? to the movies? Kenneth Branagh has gone on saying that depending on the financial success of this, he has a large amount of interest in doing a sequel. That's why they left it open. So, you know, if if it does, I think it will. you know, and I think it will I too. It, will. it didn't it didn't flop this weekend. It's still going up against Thor, and I think that yeah. if it, it is going up against Justice League next week, so it's going to have one solid week uh, to find out if they have anything. But. Uh, hopefully uh, we can convince a few people to go see it. Uh, well, maybe. We'll see. Uh, so that's it. That's the, the rest of the movie. Uh, before we go on to our final thoughts, though, we are going to look at one segment of character that you wanted more of. So of all the characters that you saw in the movie, uh, for whatever reason, we'll start with you, Alex. Who is a character that you wish you would have seen a little bit more of? I think there's two. The, whoever uh, Penelope Cruz was, because I really liked her character. I kind of like... I don't know why, because she, I, don't, I think it was just because Penelope Cruz is this gorgeous person, and um, she was still Penelope Cruz beautiful in this movie, but she was really like, she's got a scar on her face, her eyes are like kind of sunken in. She looked worn she's, down. She's worn, very yeah, worn yeah. down, and I kind of liked seeing that side of her, and I, as much as the chauffeur 
didn't matter at all. I liked him when I first saw him. So I kind of wish that he would have done something important somehow. Okay. Jordan, what do you think? Who's your character you wanted to see more of? Um, I liked Bo. I thought he was cool. He was a fun character. Yeah. yeah. He was. He had just enough, but I wish he had had a few more. I liked his... Um, he had an arc, believe it or not, from mm-hmm. kind of funny playboy to serious... Oh shit! Moments. And mm-hmm. It was interesting. Yeah. Um, also, who doesn't want more Judy Dench? It's true. Great. You know, I she was real bitchy, and I liked it. A lot. Yes. <laughs> but I love that my favorite part of her was the very end after everything had come out. Her and her uh, servant are playing cards, which it's very you know like I just I immediately think of my grandma in a spot where she's trying to just kind of. Uh, burn off some steam or just kind of relax she's going to take out the deck of cards and start playing solitaire with somebody mm-hmm. and I think it was just funny and that, that to me is very very uh, Judy Dench I thought that was kind of very funny. old lady very old lady <laughs> that's what I, mean. I don't want to say that in case my grandma listens I don't want her to think I'm calling her old um, alright Wendy what about you um, Judy Dench also you know I want a little bit more of it um, uh, let's see me I Johnny Depp. Oh, Johnny Depp, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was out pretty quick. Yeah, he was He was there and gone. Yep. You know, I wanted a little more for him, too. Because he's just kind of kooky. And I have a hard time seeing him as not Jack Sparrow, though. Yeah, I see, I don't have that. And, I'm like, I'm like, the second I see him, I'm like, Jack Sparrow, and then I'm like, no, we can't do that. He's a good actor. I just see him, anytime I see him, I just see him as Johnny Depp now. No matter what yeah. he's playing, yeah, I see him yeah, as an actor too. playing somebody yeah. because yeah. he's brought so much of himself into his right, roles right. that it's like but in he's this just one, playing he himself. He was hardly there. Yeah, he was right? in and out. He was in and out. Oh. Um, I would have to say, I think just for me, I would probably go, uh, maybe Josh Gad, just because I think he. It was nice to see him outside of comedic role, even though he did have a, a little bit of a light-hearted character, um, but at times. And if not him, I think Daisy Ridley, just because I'm excited for Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> I saw her and I was like, yes, we're, all, we're so close. We're so close. Uh, my favorite character, though, of all of them, but we got plenty of him, was Kenneth Branagh. I think he did a phenomenal job. Um, you know, my final takeaways would be they start with him. He was a great, great uh, character to revolve the storyline around. And I think that their use of that uh, character was done very well. Uh, I also really enjoyed those single shots. We didn't talk about the last one, so before we go on to your guys' final thoughts, uh, as he's leaving the train, and they actually they follow him from his room all the way through the entire train on one shot, and at one point, they're following him from behind. At one point, he pauses and is looking around at all of the other characters, and the camera gets on the other side of him and follows the rest of the way off the train from the front. Um, another one of those single shot takes that was just done very well him, um, Branagh doing a voiceover of answering the quest, answering the letter from the Colonel, Colonel Armstrong that he was never able to answer and ultimately was too late in answering because the whole family had gone through um, hell, basically. Um, so final thoughts. Uh, let's, go, let's go with Alex first. We'll make our way around the, the table. What were your final thoughts? And then before um, we get to those, we're going to do our scale this week. So one to five, one being... Mm, Pretty bad, five being awesome. And our, our scale this time is um, one to five epic mustaches. Uh, <laughs> epic mustaches. Uh, so your final thoughts, and then what would you rank it? Um, I, I liked it. I enjoyed it. But it for me and my boyfriend, it was 20 bucks to get in. I'm not sure it was worth the $20. So I think I'd give it... Like a three, like as entertained as a solid movie, but I'm not gonna buy it on DVD or Blu-ray or whatever. Okay, so a three, a three out of five, epic mustaches. Obviously. Um, Jordan, what did you think? Um, I think I'm gonna give it a four, epic mustaches. Um, I could watch Kenneth Branagh over and over and over again. Um, I could do another sequel. I thought it was done. I liked the shots, except for the eagle eye. It the was only creative, one. sure, like. but I was irritated with it. <laughs> um, and I thought the script was done really well. Um, again, there was one or two characters. I, we could have just... You never would have known if they had been cut from the scene. It would have been no big deal. Um, and I was also interested to know that the, the ending was changed from the original book, and I really liked that ending. So, 
four epic mustaches. All right. <laughs> Wendy, what about you? I'm, I'm on the same page as Alex. I'm going to say three epic mustaches. It was kind of a lull there for a little bit for me. I don't think we got into the characters as much as I wanted to know about them. And kind of expensive. Like you said, more of a you know, red box Netflix for me. Yeah, that I, I'm, I'm with you guys. I gave it a three out of five. Uh, epic mustaches, um, mustache, mustache eye. I don't. Must, is mustaches? It's mustaches. Just doesn't sound right. It seems like it needs to be more yeah, sophisticated. Like yeah, maybe that's it. Um, so I give it a three out of five. Like I said, um, Branagh is at least two and a half of those three. He was mm-hmm. phenomenal. Um, I really liked those those shots that they did. Um, even the eagle eye, Jordan. Um, for me, the reason why it doesn't completely... Um, I don't think that this script would have... Even depending on however that they did it, this script does not give it a 5 out of 5. There's no way. Uh, they didn't They didn't give enough character development. Um, and I think that the cast itself was a crutch to the overall film. Um, the amount of name recognition that you have, both up and coming as well as the established characters uh, or actors like Judy Dench, Willem Dafoe. Uh, Johnny Depp. It helped the overall film by getting people in the door. Um, and I, I think that I would definitely recommend it going forward, but I would not recommend it if you're not willing to sit through a mystery. If you need action, you know, if you listen to some of the other podcasts and you want to, or some of our other reviews and you thought that Geostorm's action was good or you thought that um, Thor Ragnarok's uh, action was good, you're definitely not going to enjoy. Uh, sitting through this one. But overall, I think it was a good movie with a, a decent script, some great acting, um, and, a, and a very well put together twist at the end that didn't leave a whole lot of holes. We were only able to find a couple. Um, all right, so I think that's it. And thank you guys for coming in. Did you, did you enjoy it? Yeah, fun. Okay. We were a little worried about how, how this was going to work. I Hopefully, uh, the, the stereo uh, recording it works over well. Um, and I think that this will allow us to do some more larger group discussions in the future. Uh, next week, we are back in Ohio to review Justice League. And uh, kind of excited for it. I think more and more the reviews are starting to come out from the uh, the media viewings. And they are positive so far. So maybe a little bit more excitement for Justice League than there was a couple weeks ago. Always remember, if you want to reach out to us, you can via email, driveineventide at gmail.com, or you can follow us or tweet us uh, on Twitter, at driveineventide. So thanks for joining us today. Um, If you have any questions, reach out to us. Otherwise, we will see you guys next week. Drive home safe. (laughs) 